The theme of TEDx Naperville this year is You Are Here. And we are all here today because of energy. Yet for something that we use and rely on every single day, energy remains a very abstract and oftentimes elusive concept for most of us. And this is why I believe we need to think differently about energy. So now, usually with energy talks, we like to give you a lot of facts and figures and graphs, maybe something like this, the fact that the U.S. consumes almost 19 million barrels of oil per day. Now, just stop and think about that, 19 million barrels of oil per day. In fact, U.S. oil consumption represents the largest transfer of wealth in the history of mankind. I find that both remarkable and sobering. Or if we turn our attention to something like electricity, we might look at a fact like the average household in the U.S. uses 11,498 kilowatt hours on average per year, which means nothing to almost anyone in this audience and really means nothing to me as well. And I did a little bit more analysis into this slide, and in fact, I came to the conclusion the slide might possibly represent the most boring slide in the history of mankind. <laughs> or I could show you something like this, a chart that shows you the impact of your energy decisions on the world. But I still don't think that really connects us very well to energy. So today I'm going to do two entirely different things. I'm going to talk to you about reflection, and I'm going to talk today about choices. But first, let me start with a story. So I was driving home from work a couple of, of weeks ago. It was a Friday evening, and I was doing what I usually do. I was admiring this beautiful skyline that we have in Chicago, and I was thinking about my day, listening to some music, what I usually do. And I looked back in my rearview mirror, and I saw the Field Museum was marking the 120th anniversary of the Chicago World Fair. Now, there's something that's always been very fascinating to me about the Chicago World Fair. It's somewhat mysterious. I started thinking to myself, what could have life possibly been like in 1893? I started dreaming a little bit. You know, if I looked at the moon in 1893, would someone have ever thought putting a man on the moon would have been possible? Or if we watched a movie in 1893, would we have ever thought that this would have been possible? This is how we watch movies today. In 1893, we put still photographs on a wheel and manually turned it through a beam of light. So I thought to myself, I'm going to do a little bit more research into the Chicago World Fair. And I did that. And three things emerged that I found quite interesting. I'd like to share those with you today. The first was that Henry Ford saw an internal combustion engine, and he said to himself, I can do that better, and I can do that more efficiently. I'm going to go back to Michigan, and I'm going to do just that. And you all know how that story ends. The second was at the time, there was what was called the War of Currents going on. Thomas Edison was advocating for a DC-based power system, and Westinghouse, Tesla, and others were advocating for an AC-based power system. Westinghouse won the bid to light the World Fair by $155,000. And this was largely considered to be a major turning point in the War of Currents. And the third thing that really stood out to me was Daniel Burnham was credited with planning the World Fair. And it was what he thought a beautiful city should look like. Now, all these things caused me to reflect. Here's why. If Henry Ford came back today, nothing on the vehicle would look familiar to him except for the gas tank. In fact, he might even be a little bit disappointed in us because he, in fact, designed the Model T to run on three different sources of fuel. If Westinghouse came back today, he would absolutely be amazed by the complexity and the size of our grid, but he would recognize the AC-based power system that all of us rely on. And if Daniel Burnham came back today, we've certainly designed many beautiful cities throughout the world, but some of our cities are not so beautiful. Here is a photograph from just a couple of weeks ago in Harbin. It was a city of about 11 million people. It was completely shut down because of smog. Schools were closed, businesses were closed. They even said, we won't cite drivers for running red lights because you can't see the red light. So where are we at in 2013? 
Well, the energy landscape is changing. And it's changing significantly. I'll share with you four points that I think are changing right now. This year, the U.S. is set to surpass Saudi Arabia and Russia to become the world's largest oil producer. Number two, natural gas is now abundant and cheap in the United States. And alternative sources are increasingly coming online as the technology improves and the costs go down. And unprecedented levels of people are moving to urban environments, and they're demanding transportation, fuel, and electricity at levels humankind have never experienced before. In fact, we recently just reached a point where now more people live in urban environments than rural environments, and that trend is expected to continue. So I said I'd talk a little bit about choices. Let me talk now about choices. But here's the thing when it comes to energy and choices. We really have little to no choices. I'll explain why. 97% of our vehicle fleet in the U.S. depends on a petroleum-based product. Now, oil is bought and sold on a global market. And if we want to understand global markets, we can think of something as simple as a swimming pool. That means if we put more water into the deep end, that impacts the swimmers on the short, on the, on the shallow, and the deep end fairly equally. That means no matter how much we produce, to some degree, we'll continue to import prices. If we looked at the electricity grid, most of your homes look something like this. If you want electricity, you have a socket, you plug it into the wall. That's your choice. It's a one-way street. You have no way to communicate with the grid. We can think of it like this. We can think of it as a one-way street. And in fact, it's not just a one-way street, but it's a really old one-way street. It's aging. We're expecting it to do things that it can't handle. If we turn to cities for a second, here is a NASA image of Beijing in 1977 and 2011. The blue areas represent areas of urbanization. You can see this is massive change in a relatively short amount of time. And why does this matter? This matters because of science, we know that what happens in Beijing doesn't just impact people in Beijing, it impacts the entire world. So when we think about energy, some of this is so overwhelming, it's hard to think, well, what do I do as an individual? Now, I don't want to oversimplify energy and what we can do about energy, because it's a very complicated situation, and there are many factors that go into energy. But today, I'd like to submit to you one thing. I believe that if you're a consumer and you have one choice, you tend to blame the world. You say, well, it is what it is. And what can I do about it? Yet, if you have multiple choices, you tend to blame yourself. So let's, let's think about it this way. If I want to fly from Chicago to Houston next week, and I only have one choice, it's a flight at Monday at 6 p.m. for $300, and they assign me a seat, I take it, I'm happy. If I go online and I find that I have a choice of 60 different flights at different times, and layovers, and prices, and window, and aisle, and first class, and coach, if I think I made the wrong decision, I now blame myself for making the wrong decision. So why is this so important when it comes to energy? Well, this is fundamental when it comes to energy, because I believe that energy is one of the most consequential choices that we as humans make. I think we should feel the impact of those choices. So let me give you some evidence of why I think we need to think differently about energy. Here are the questions that we tend to ask about energy. Gas prices go up and down. We're typically on a crisis, a response, or complacency mode. We ask questions like, why are gas prices so high? I can guarantee you this will happen again as soon as gas prices go back up again. This is an entirely wrong question to be asking. We need to be asking questions like, why does my car only accept gas? Or why don't we have affordable choices of vehicle fuels? These are the questions that we need to be asking. We're asking the entirely wrong questions when it comes to energy. If you want more evidence of this, do something very simple. Fill up your gas tank next time you go to the grocery store. Walk down a supermarket aisle. We as American consumers demand choices in almost everything that we buy, in a lot of choices. And then go to the fuel pump. You essentially have one choice. Is that okay with you? So we've looked at, 1890, at 1893 at 2013. Let's talk a little bit about where I think we can go in the next couple of years. Here are the things I think we need to move forward. We need discovery science. We need technology innovation. We need entrepreneurialism. 
We need informed policy and regulation, and we need engaged consumers. And I hope my last point just convinced you of why we need engaged consumers. So here's what we're doing when it comes to transportation. Right now, we are working to develop a battery that is five times the density of today's batteries at one-fifth the cost. And we're going to achieve this within five years. This could fundamentally change the way we drive. Same thing with natural gas vehicles. They're market ready. Honda already has one. Chevy's coming out with one in 2015. This gives us choices as consumers. What are we doing with the grid? We're building a smart grid. This is something that we're working on today. Now, you hear this term often. What is a smart grid to imply that our grid today is dumb? In fact, it's, it's still a fairly complex machine. But when we say smart grid, here are a couple of key points. Right now, our grid is a just-in-time system. What we need is ability to store energy when we need it. So for instance, right now, when you have excess wind energy, you either start seeing negative pricing or we just shut it off and throw it away altogether. This really doesn't make any sense. We need energy storage to make our grid more effective. To make our grid more effective, consumers need to start having choices. In a smart grid, you could do that. You could start to actually decide what kind of electricity you want to buy and for what price. That would fundamentally change the way we think about energy. And what are we doing about cities? Well, here is a picture. On your left side, you see an actual image of a site called Lakeside. And here's an artist rendition of what the site might look like in the future. We are working with a number of partners to look at the site a little bit differently and plan cities in a different way. When my colleagues and I started talking to the urban planners and developers of this site, we, we found a couple of really interesting things. They said to us, you know, we're really comfortable and we're used to working to develop sites at the 30 to 50 acre scale. But at 600 acres, we really just don't know. We don't really know how to do this. So we're bringing to bear our computational tools and our decision support tools to look at the site a little bit differently. A really key point to this site is typically these sites are planned so we look at systems independently. So we plan for energy, we plan for transportation, we plan for water, we plan for air quality. What we want to do with this site is look at this entirely differently we want to say, if we pull an energy lever and we plan it a little bit differently, how does that then impact the air quality? We want to do that in a more real-time way. We think this could fundamentally change the way we think and plan cities. And one key takeaway of this is that we start looking at this as an energy system, and not just as single sources or as single issues. We look at it as an energy system. And what do I think is most exciting about all of this? Well, what I think is most exciting about all of this is I believe and I'm convinced that in 120 years from now, we'll look back and say, wow, I can't believe things worked like that in 2013. And I think we'll do this if we push science to its limits. I think we'll do this if we engage consumers. I think if we do that, we'll do what we've done since before 1893. We'll innovate our way to a bigger, brighter, and better future. So where does this all leave us? Well, this is critical for all of us because energy is at the very foundation of our economy. It's a critical aspect of our national security. And if those two reasons aren't enough, it's the way that we'll leave this world that we all share. So I'd like to finish today by leaving you with a question. Are the choices that we have in energy leading us to a more energy secure future? Thank you very much.